Welcome to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our discussion with Medea Benjamin about U.S.-Saudi relations and what that means for the rest of us. And now joining us again in the studio is Medea Benjamin. Thanks for joining us again. Good to be with you, Paul. So quickly, Medea is the co-founder of the peace group Code Pink and the human rights organization Global Exchange. Her latest book is Kingdom of the Unjust Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. So we ended up segment one, and you should watch segment one at first, it would make more sense, um, with the one thing a Trump presidency and the Saudis have on, in common is, at least on, on, on the face of it, is they both want regime change in Iran and they want it bad. Uh, Trump has built a whole foreign policy team now and the one connective tissue between all the people he's choosing, you know, whether it's Flynn or Mattis or any of these guys, they all want to attack Iran in some form or another. And so do the Saudis. The, the Saudi, we know from WikiLeaks, the Saudi king said, cut off the head of the snake, which meant Iran. And uh, I was at a dinner once, uh, I've told this story before on The Real News, but I got, for some crazy reason, I was invited to this uh, organization, Enigmas, I, I, I believe that's their name. It's, it's a crazy f think tanky policy group funded by Raytheon and Boeing and uh, General Dynamics and all the big uh, arms manufacturers uh, that lobbies and holds educationals for Gulf states. And they have one on the best way to fight terrorism with tanks and air, air, jet aircraft policy and all the rest. And they opened up their Washington office and had a dinner with all the big arms manufacturers there. And I'm at this table. And I got invited because I'm our bureau chief on Capitol Hill and all the bureau chiefs were invited. And the only conversation at the table is how much Saudi Arabia wants to attack Iran. And in fact, that Saudis are far more interested in it than the Israelis. And the Israelis, mm -hmm. many people thought it was more for domestic consumption, have this existential threat of Iran, that they weren't even as serious as the Saudis who were really serious of wanting the uh, Americans to attack Iran and, and try to force regime change. So why, do you, why are the Saudis so intent on this? Well, you could either go back many, many, uh, a, a long time, or you could go to recent history of 1979 and talk about the Shia-Sunni split. Uh, but 1979 is when the uh, Shia theocracy comes to power in uh, I Iran, overthrowing the Shah, uh, and putting itself forward as the beacon of Islam in the world, as opposed to the Saudis. Uh, and the Saudis saying, no, we are the place where the holiest lands are of Mecca and Medina. Um, we are the champions of Islam in the world, of, of the, the, the Sunni Wahhabi uh, version. And the Saudis have so much oil money that they are able then to spread this with massive propaganda and textbooks that are sent out and the creation of all of these schools all over uh, the Middle East, North Africa, um, and spreading their ideology. Uh, and it becomes a uh, Saudi-Iran uh, competition uh, that, uh, ironically, in many ways, the U.S. Uh, helps to foment with its invasion of Iraq, um, sharpening the sectarian divide internally, not only in Iraq, but uh, giving strength and putting in power a, a Shia government that is close to Iran. I was, just, I was about to say, it's so much in the American interest to have this rivalry, because imagine the alternative. Imagine a Saudi-Iranian alliance that would create this pan-Islamic uh, entity. It would be a rival, I mean, not in terms of modern economy, but in terms of the amount of money and power become a, a middle-level superpower at any rate. And the oil all the oil. Imagine if you had the Iraq, Iran, and Saudis all working together, um, it would be tremendous powerhouse. So yes, the U.S. with the divide and conquer, the U.S. with uh, creating weak states in the Middle East, I mean, certainly the division uh, of Iraq uh, has been um, something that has shattered the, uh, the uh, uh, the foundations of the Iraqi government, but uh, put an Iranian, uh, pro-Iran government in power, which has uh, then Iran is seen as having a foothold not only in Iraq, but in other parts of the region. And 
so you see the proxy war between the Saudis and Iran playing out in Syria and in Iraq and Libya and uh, Lebanon and elsewhere. And if it wasn't for this rivalry, perhaps Saudi Arabia doesn't need to spend $114 billion in arms purchases over eight years. Right. So it certainly helps the weapons industry to keep this rivalry going. In terms of the Saudi narrative domestically, uh, why is it, 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 is it important to have this kind of existential enemy in terms of the way uh, it deals with the Islamic world? Very much so, because it allows them to hype up the nationalism that we are uh, under attack. Look at the Iranian influence on our border in Yemen. Look at the Iranians trying to uh, take over in neighboring Bahrain. Uh, that we have to uh, be united. So anybody who rises up to question the Saudi kingdom uh, and certainly the Shia who are trying to just get their rights as equal citizens are seen as agents of Iran. Um, so yes, it very much helps to try to keep cohesion within the Saudi regime, especially at a time when the oil prices are down, when they're running at a deficit, when they're having to cut a lot of benefits that they have given out to the Saudi people in the past. Uh, it's become even more important. At the Republican uh, National Convention, uh, Giuliani made a statement which I thought was rather important. In the last seven months, there have been five major Islamic terrorist attacks on us and our allies. Donald Trump has said the first step in defeating our enemies is to identify them properly and see the connections between them so we can find them and catch them. We must commit ourselves to unconditional victory against them. This includes undoing one of the worst deals America ever made, Obama's nuclear agreement with Iran that will eventually, that will eventually let them become a nuclear power and ha is putting billions of dollars back into a country that's the world's largest supporter of terrorism. So there's Giuliani saying the, the global terrorist threat of the Iranians is against the United States, not the Saudis. Now, Trump did get off message a little bit in the campaign where he actually once or a couple of times did blame terrorism and 9-11 on the Saudis. But all the people around him that he's appointed don't ever say a, a negative word about the Saudis. It's all against Iran. Right. And it turned out that Trump was even setting up business deals during his campaign with the Saudis. Uh, and yes, when you look at who he's brought in, there's not one person in the entire team uh, who is not uh, vehemently opposed to the Iranian government, uh, trying to find ways of uh, pushing against the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, and I think that's very scary right now to think that uh, you have in place uh, the person who is in charge of Iran policy during this transition time is a woman who was a chief of staff for the very right-wing congresswoman Ileana ross Lettinen, uh, and who has been trying for years to encourage the U.S. to bomb uh, Iranian nuclear facilities, has been supporting the terrorist group, the Mujahideen, and working to get them off the terrorist list. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, whether it's um, uh, Flynn or even Pompeo, who was the congressperson who has been extremely anti-Iran. Um, the Most importantly, Pence, their Cheney, a president, a president Pence. It is, uh, I think, very disturbing to think what they are going to do to try to tear up this Iran nuclear deal. Now, it's important for your listeners to understand this is not a bilateral deal. This is a deal that involves uh, Europe involves China and Russia, and they're not about to tear up the deal. Uh, and uh, they are, I think, very worried uh, about what a Trump administration would do in trying to uh, cement the, the deal. Uh, there are a lot of business interests that have already uh, amped up their relationships with Iran uh, that certainly uh, would be affected if the U.S. tried to do something like punish foreign uh, companies that are doing business with Iran. 
So there's a lot of troublemaking that a Trump administration could do, even if it couldn't tear up the Iran nuclear deal. Yeah, they can impose, in fact, they already recently did, more or less, but they can impose even heavier sanctions for other reasons. Well, the uh, Obama, during the Obama administration, that just passed in Congress, yeah. but what, uh, what a Trump administration could do, I think, is then impose sanctions on foreign companies doing business with Iran. The, uh, there's been some discussion about how the country's other signatories would not go along with ripping up the agreement, would push back on, on some, time, some type of assault on Iran. But I just would remind everyone that Germany, France, Russia, and China were all against the war in Iraq, and that didn't stop anything. Well, also, let's look at how this could potentially play out within Iran. We already know that there's hardliners in Iran who were against the deal, uh, who always said, you can't negotiate with the West. They're the devils. They'll never go through on these agreements. Uh, and who would be strengthened by this uh, Trump troublemaking would be the hardliners in Iran, uh, who could then use this as a, as a reason to uh, pull out of the deal or uh, could give them leverage in the next elections. I mean, there's a lot of things that could strengthen the very elements in Iran that we should be uh, uh, not strengthening. It's a mu mutually advantageous dance of death. That's right. It's the extreme right on both sides uh, supporting each other and giving each other a reason to exist. Uh, in terms of the critique of Iran as being, a, uh, to use Giuliani's words, uh, Pence's words, uh, all of them really, Iran is the greatest source of international terrorism. Uh, is there any evidence of that? Well, I would certainly say that the Saudis are the source, uh, the greatest source of international terrorism, but now Iran has become caught up, uh, as we talked about before, in these proxy wars. Uh, it's the Saudis that are supporting the Sunni extremists, um, but uh, Iran now is um, very much involved, even if they weren't in the beginning. I mean, just take the, 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 uh, um, the, the, the war in Yemen, which gets very little coverage in the U.S. press. Uh, I don't think the Iranians were involved at all in the beginning uh, when the Saudis looked at the uh, one of the uh, the factions inside Yemen, the Houthis, and said, oh, they're a, a, a proxy for Iran, and that's why we're going to go in there. And they've been doing this just tremendous bombing campaign for the last 20 months. Uh, Iran eventually has to get involved or feels it has to get involved, but I, I think that's a result of uh, the Saudis' initial bombing campaign. Is there any evidence uh, of Iranian-sponsored terrorist attacks on the United States uh, or conspiring to? There was, one, there was one kerfuffle in Florida, but it turned out to be nothing. As far as I know, there is nothing at all. Uh, all of the terrorist attacks of the United States uh, have been somehow involved with a group that is Sunni-influenced, and many of them can be traced back in one way or another to Saudi Arabia. Well, when they really talk, when they talk about uh, Iranian-sponsored terrorism, they don't say so because they claim it's attacking the United States. We're really taught what they really mean is Hezbollah. They don't like the fact there's a military force on the border of Israel that can actually defy Israeli power, which Hezbollah did in Lebanon and essentially defeated an Israeli invasion. Uh, that's what they really have in mind. Well, right, and you talked about your story and saying that the Saudis were the even more adamant than the Israelis about attacking Iran, but let's not belittle the influence of Israel in all of this. Uh, Israel uh, was the major player uh, internationally trying to quash the Iran nuclear deal, terrified of U.S. becoming closer to Iran and U.S. lifting more and more sanctions against Iran. Uh, and I think will be a major player, along with the Soviets, uh, in a Trump administration. Russians. Huh? Russians. You said Soviets. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> along with the Russians <laughs> in, in trying to do something in the, in, during the Trump administration. And let's also remember that as part of the, um, the uh, concession prize for the Iran nuclear deal, uh, the Israelis were given a, a large increase in... Uh, U.S. military aid that went up to almost $4 billion from $3 billion a year for the next 10 years, more sophisticated weapons as well. Uh, so 
Uh, I just don't want us to belittle the role that the Israelis are yeah, playing. Yeah, I, I was trying to highlight the, uh, <laughs> the less spoken about role of the Saudis. And, and an, remember now that the Saudis and the Israelis are working together. And this was so. once uh, clandestinely, and now it is overt. And there's an important WikiLeaks that I don't think gets enough attention. It appears to be a State Department memo uh, to Hillary Clinton. Uh, where they say that we can to get the Israelis to go along with the Iran deal, we need to help uh, anti-Assad forces overthrow Assad. Because if we're seen to be helping to overthrow Assad, they won't be as concerned about the Iran deal. And clearly that's about cutting weapons to Hezbollah as a primary objective of the Israelis. Um, uh, this, this, I, this issue of Giuliani's speech, the reason I think it's so critical, and, and similar things said by Pence and all of these appointees, that if they do want to attack Iran, and they do, they've said so over and over again, uh, they being Trump team, and Trump himself has been quite vitriolic on the issue of ripping up the agreement and so on, uh, they're going to have trouble, I think, uh, gathering American public opinion on this. Uh, First of all, there's no direct threat from the Iranians. The, the, issue, the consequence of an Iranian attack is going to drive the price of oil through the roof, which is going to start affecting people at the pump, which is, which is serious for them politically. Um, the Iranians are unlikely just to take it, which means it's opening up another kind of gates of hell scenario in the Middle East. Who knows where it leads? Um, and, and, and one wonders if, you know, Pence says he is going to model his vice presidency after, after Cheney. Well, I think there's excellent evidence that Cheney, at the very least in terms of 9-11, did what he could to make sure American intelligence agencies were disorganized and not acting on, on evidence uh, that might have led to preventing 9-11. I mean, you put all this together and, and, and you get the, the, the drums of anti-Iranian war are going to start pounding after the inauguration. I think it's more going to be a uh, Iraq redux in terms of the Iraqis are not complying with weapons the inspection. Yeah, yeah and, and just, just as we said that around Iraq and that fed into the war invasion of Iraq, they're going to do the same thing about Iran. The Iranians are not complying. The Iranians are not complying. When the Iranians are complying, but it doesn't matter. It's what is being put out and who has the, uh, the, the, the soapbox. And so my fear is that what we're going to hear constantly from a Trump administration is uh, the Obama administration gave away everything and gave the Iranians the money that was actually theirs that we had frozen. Uh, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to be hard line and uh, the Iranians are not complying. And um, if you have been watching Fox News, that's what you would be getting already. Uh, you would be already um, primed for uh, the uh, U.S. to say there's nothing we can do except take out the Iran nuclear facilities. Now, on the other hand, you have American people who are tired of these wars, who don't want war, more wars in the Middle East. And um, frankly, we're more or less promised that by Trump. That's who, right. And we're also promised that Trump is going to rebuild America and make it great again. And that means jobs, 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 and creation of things here at home, not to be distracted by these wars in the Middle East. And also his idea that we should be friends with the Russians uh, is contradictory to this idea that we should be um, uh, militarily involved in, in Iran. So there are contradictions, there are questions around this, uh, and I think this is uh, an area where I, as an activist and other act activists, have to uh, find our hope in our position of saying that we have to uh, keep building up an American sentiment against involvement in another war. Uh, we have to get out the truth about Iran is complying. We have to work with our friends in the, uh, uh, in, in the European community who want to see this deal uh, not only continued but strengthened. Um, and, you know, that's where our hope has to be. All right. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Mm -hmm.